Hey guys, Cockapunk here. Um, this is take two. I usually do videos in one take, um, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> but this is a take two because I was watching the video and I was like, wow, I'm leaving out information left and right. Like, I need to double down here. So, we're doubling down on double take, um, which means I've started my second one of this beer. Um, we're going to talk about auto mags in a second and how awesome auto mags are. Even though my name is Cocker Punk, I definitely have a huge soft spot for auto mags. Um, my taste for them was acquired about a year or two after Cockers because there were these guys who would shoot these crazy guns that didn't have back blocks. What the hell are these guys up to? So I had to buy one and try it out. Turns out they're awesome. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, also my, my auto mag in my gun collection is a gun that I bring in almost everywhere I go uh, because it's very reliable and very consistent and uh, it's it's definitely a go-to gun for me if I'm not gonna play pump I'm probably gonna play with my auto mag um, and this beer is very much in the exact same light and actually they're color matching so kinda cute it's like I did this on purpose but I didn't I swear I just ran into my surly furious um, you know part of the fridge <laughs> so the beer is Surly Brewing Company's Furious. Um, it's an American style IPA. Um, it's about six and a half by volume. Um, it is. Uh, we talked about abrasive in the last episode in the in the uh, in the Cocker episode. Abrasive is um, abrasive is like this on steroids. Um, Furious is is a little bit more. It's still in your face with flavor, the same way any Surly Brewing Company beer is. Like when you drink it, this isn't your Miller Lights, this isn't your Grain Belt Premiums, this isn't your uh, Bud Select, this isn't your uh, you know Newcastle Brown Ale kind of smooth tasting beers. This is like a you love beer in your face uh, kind of a beer. Um, and again, it's very hoppy. American style IPAs, IPAs are usually pretty hoppy. So it's very hoppy, um, but l like abrasive, it's matched with this very citrus flavor. And in fact, in this beer, get in focus, in focus. In this beer, um, it is uh, matched with it, it tastes like grapefruit to me um, as its aftertaste. So it's very hoppy on the front end, and then it tastes like grapefruit as it uh, as it finishes. Um, it's absolutely delicious. Like I said, if I go to a bar or a restaurant that has a good selection of taps here in Minnesota, um, they'll almost always have this, and this is a go-to. So if I don't want to try something new and be disappointed by something new, or go for you know your your grain belts, your summits, your your uh, kind of second-tier style beers, this is the one I go to. Um, it's absolutely delicious. And if you can get your hands on some Surly Furious, do it now. So with that, I think I'll conclude my Surly Furious review because it's just delicious. But we're going to talk about one of my favorite guns ever built. Um, this is an Automag RT. Um, it is my personal Automag. It's the only one I own currently. Um, I have removed the sight rail which fit on like that gives it a little bit more color this splash anodizing is very rare um, there weren't many made with this and so that's why I own this this is also a foregrip mount so you can imagine this this foregrip mounted to the base of this um, just gives it a little bit more color but also gives it a little bit more weight so I've pulled both of those off um, to just keep it a little bit lighter weight and a little bit more compact pulls the foregrip in a little bit um, which I like um, <clears throat> so it's got this red uh, red black splash which ironically enough matches the furious can notice I think I'll have to like rename this gun uh, furious or something like that because um, she's damn sexy isn't she Anyway, so we'll get into the reason why I bought a classic RT instead of a normal RT a little bit later in the episode. But first we're going to go through kind of the history of automags and the development. Uh, automags, again, like autocockers, came out in 1991, 1992 um, with the level 7 bolt kit in the classic automag, which is those gray style stainless steel bodies that you see. 
and the stainless steel, the full stainless steel valve with a single trigger, uh, a plastic trigger frame, but that plastic is ridiculously strong. So unlike autocockers where I said you need to replace the trigger frame immediately if it's plastic, the plastic trigger frame on auto makes you don't. It is insanely strong. I've literally hammered on one with a hammer as hard as I could and I couldn't break it. So those are just fine if you like single triggers anyway. So that was the original gun. Then they came out with the mini mag in like 92, 93, which is essentially that gun with a new body. Um, it, had, it came with a couple other little parts, but mostly it was that gun with, it was still a stainless steel body, but it was uh, styled differently. Um, the next gun that they came out with, uh, those both take the level 7 classic valve, by the way. The next gun that they came out with was the RT classic. At the time it was just the RT, but um, later became called the RT Classic. The uh, RT Classic, supposedly they had the design for this valve done in about 1993, but um, they couldn't release it to the public until 1996, uh, late 96, um, early 97, because it, this valve requires um, compressed air, and compressed air had not existed in paintball until around that time. Uh, um, so everybody was shooting CO2, and this valve unlike the modern electronic guns, which um, I forget who it is, but somebody on TechBB is doing the CO2 gun challenge, which I'm a huge fan of, where they're shooting DMs and Egos and stuff like that with CO2 on them. And the trouble there is you run into liquid CO2 in the valve and you can pop the solenoid. But if you make sure that you don't have liquid CO2 uh, materialize in the gun, you can actually run the two interchangeably. And autocockers are actually reasonably CO2 resistant, so it's not too big a deal for them to keep running CO2. You can actually run classic valves on CO2 very easily, but this valve has uh, such high flow rates through such small passages that you can actually freeze the valve um, with just a few shots of liquid CO2. So uh, it's an actual gun that will actually break <laughs> if you use CO2, and so that's why they didn't release it to the public until compressed air had kind of caught on um, in the late 90s. So after that, they took a few years off and, uh, frankly, got behind the game because in 97, that's when the actually reliable autocockers came out and compressed air helped their reliability as well. So they kind of got behind and until about 2001 or 2002 um, is when they started coming out with the ULE style um, guns. These were, uh, until that point, obviously my guns has a stainless steel body. Uh, the valves were all stainless steel. Um, very heavy, but reliable. Um, they started coming out with the ULE, which is ultralight engineering. They came out with the ULE body, so it was no longer twist lock, had cocker threads. Um, they came out with the X valve, which is a RT valve made out of aluminum. And they came out with like the level 10, and they came out with a bunch of stuff right there in like the 2002 category. Um, and that's pretty much where the gun ended up. They they ended up releasing something called the ULE Trigger, which is a modified on-off. We'll talk about that in a little bit to lighten the trigger pull. Um, the ULE uh, on-off is actually pretty amazing how it works. But um, so that that was kind of the development of the gun uh, through the decades. It's always been a reliable, uh, easy to set up and tune gun compared to the autococker. And that's why it has gained its reputation as a reliable shooting gun. Um, the cool thing about this gun is, uh, so air goes into the valve. In the classic RTs, it actually goes through the rail. And then this this back, uh, back frame screw is actually a banjo bolt. Same as the front block of an autococker, actually, it turns out. So it, it's a banjo bolt. It's got ports. And then this is, ooh, that's how the air gets into the valve unlike uh, regular guns where the macro line goes directly into the side of the valve. So that is where the frame screw screws in. And so the whole back of the valve here is a regulator. Um, this whole back section is a spring pack. And uh, the RT works because it's a normally open valve, even though it's a regulator, which is unique in regulators, I believe. That's why it's so fast. Um, so then the next step after it's regulated, it actually runs along a pathway right on the top here, and that's the on-off. That's where this little pin 
right there is where the sear comes up and, and pokes the gun. And so if we pull out the on-off, let's see if it'll work this time. Nope, it didn't. Okay, so that's the on-off pin. You can see it in there. It's stuck in that top O-ring. Um, that on-off pin, is you can see it's stuck in that O-ring. That's because the air is going to blow down on top of that O-ring and um, push that pin. Come on, focus. Push that pin out the base of the gun here, and that's where we get our, our trigger tension. It pushes the sear back, which pushes it all the way back into the trigger frame, which is about right here. So when we pull the trigger then, um, we, we pull the sear off the, valve, off the, off the uh, bolt, so the bolt comes flying forward and fires the power pulse, which is in the dump chamber, which is right here, and then the spring pulls that back. Now as long as we hold down that trigger, we're pushing that on-off pin up into that O-ring that it's stuck in right now, pushing it up in there and preventing the dump chamber from filling. So just like the tail on a DM bolt um, seals off the dump chamber, the on-off here seals off the dump chamber from the regulator. So then when we release the trigger, that pin is pushed down because it's got all this pressure on top of it, pushes down and fills the dump chamber and the sear comes up and grabs the bolt to prevent the bolt from flying off. So that's how the gun works and the coolest thing about this gun is it's super easy to troubleshoot this gun. Very easy to find leaks because if the gun is leaking when the trigger is, is not pulled then you know you have a power tube o-ring failure. That's pretty much what it is. That means you need to go into your power tube, whether you have a level 10 or a level 7 gun. This is a level 10 gun. Um, you need to replace that O-ring. Once you replace that O-ring, it will stop leaking. The other source of leaks is if you pull the trigger and you're holding the trigger down and it's leaking. If that's the case, then either your on-off O-ring is toast or one of your seals in the regulator is toast. So it's really nice you can essentially divide the gun in half by pulling the trigger if it's leaking when the gun when the trigger isn't pulled then it's something that has to do with the dump chamber and forward the power tube or if it's leaking when you have the trigger back then it has to do with the regulator or the on off one of those two so very easy to troubleshoot a gun like this um, the level 10 as I said this is a level 10 gun um, I consider the level 10 to be mandatory for a modern auto mag. It has a little fuzzy tip bolt, um, which is the same. It's, it's also a, a sophisticated anti-chop system that uses uh, these carriers, these O-ring carriers of different sizes. And the reason why they're different sizes is because O-rings, it turns out, and this is something that I've learned in my daily life as an engineer, O-rings are horrible. <laughs> they're never the same size especially on the thousandth of an inch scale which is massive they're just so inconsistently manufactured so it, when you're tuning a level 10 use the same o-ring put it in these different carriers and the way you want to do it is you want to go to the biggest carrier the biggest carrier that doesn't leak once you stop the leaking stop don't go any farther so and again, that'll be a leak out the barrel, out the tip of the gun. Um, once you stop that leak, then you've got the right carrier. Now, you can adjust um, the, the point at which this thing fires back, and thus the point at which it recocks with shims. And they do work. I, I don't usually use the shims, honestly, because I don't really see a need in any of my automags. I've never run into a problem with, the, with running shims. So... I usually don't run any shims. They recommend you run two. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't buy it. But um, that's how you tune in a, a level ten. You, you just need to pick the carrier size where it doesn't leak, but it's as large as can possibly be, and um, that works pretty much every time. So the other thing is you can adjust the velocity with the back cap here. Um, the ULT trigger kit, the ULE trigger kit, is a new one of these guys. And essentially it works by having your pin there, by having a tiny, tiny diameter pin. 
and that means that there's a very small area that that pressure is pushing down on so the trigger pull is very very light and uh, you can get borderline walkable trigger frame uh, trigger uh, pulls out of a ULT mag um, on a double trigger uh, it, it's not that difficult to do you can do it so let's get into why I bought a classic valve or a classic RT instead of a normal gun. The, uh, another cool thing about automags is the parts are super modular and this is what makes shopping for automags kind of hard for people because they don't understand that there's valves and there's bodies and there's trigger frames and rails and all of them are more or less interchangeable with each other. You can put a regular automag stainless steel body with an X-valve and a uh, Intelli frame and a ULE body or a ULE rail and it'll work. You can put an X-valve in it, you can put an automag valve in it, you can put uh, whatever you want in it. All these parts are super modular between the two. There's a couple of different little nuances like the rail and the sear need to match and the rail and the foregrip need to match but other than that you can more or less take a hundred dollar automag that you bought off eBay and interchange every single part and build yourself into a monster uh, mechanical automag or emag for that matter um, and at every step of the way your gun will work every upgraded part so the reason why I bought a classic is because uh, obviously it has this unique air rail system and the body goes so far back and the valve is of smaller diameter um, and that system is unique. They're, they're the only guns that don't fit any of the other parts and so um, the reason why I bought this was on purpose because I'm not stupid because at least three or four people that I've met who get into automags will buy you know your hundred and twenty five dollar stainless steel everything you know classic valve classic body carbon fiber plastic grip frame and this hundred and twenty five dollar gun and they will turn it into a six hundred fifty dollar auto mag monster x valve level 10 ULA body Delara by, uh, rail uh, logic framed like super mag and <laughs> Because that's what happens is you're shooting this stainless steel auto mag, you're like, oh yeah, this is great, this is kind of fun. Like, I can see myself shooting this gun. I really would like to use my ego barrels, my cocker barrels, my intimidator barrels on this. So I'm going to put a Yoli body on it. Oh, that was really nice. It lightened up the gun really well. I'm going to put an X valve in it. <laughs> and pretty soon, since the whole thing is modular, you can go from a $100 auto mag to like a $600 auto mag monster and essentially have purchased two identical guns and then you can go sell all your stainless steel parts on eBay and it, it's like a drug <laughs> it's hard to stop without going all the way and so that's why I bought an RT is because um, the RTs don't fit any other parts so uh, I'm not tempted to futz with it and so the other thing we're going to talk about here is trigger frames and uh, that's about the only other thing besides bolt that uh, you can adjust or play. Ooh. We are currently running out of air. These guns are high pressure guns and a thousand PSI ain't going to cut it at this point. So uh, I can't show you but I can show you like this. See how there's a pin that poked out there? That trigger pin needs to be adjusted properly for whatever frame you choose to pick. So this frame Everybody knows automag, the frame, or the trigger is just dead without air. That's because this little pin, which like we were talking about before, is directly connected to the on-off up here. Now, when the on-off is pressurized, it's poking this pin out. That pin needs to be set so that there's a slight amount of trigger movement before you trigger the gun. Once you trigger the gun, then there should be essentially infinite movement, right? So you don't want a trigger frame that has trigger stops or any sort of futzy autococker style stuff, okay? We're way beyond that. <laughs> and frankly, I think if you buy an automag and you don't buy the Intelli frame, it's by far the best frame that you could ever purchase for an automag. You can get it with this double trigger style or you can get it with a blade trigger, um, either or. 
Um, I like the double trigger. It's a little bit more old school, so um, I like that uh, trigger better. But like I'm saying, that's the only other adjustment you have to make. And in, in that case, you actually take that little pin and you can twist it, and that's how you make it longer or shorter. So that's that's the only other adjustment besides velocity and level 10 tuning that you have to do to these guns. Um, which is, again, a reason why I like to carry one around in my gear bag because it's very easy to go to as a go-to gun. So um, that's a little short, brief tuning upgrades, what to look for if you want to buy one uh, kind of gun. You can build one of these, like I said, with the ULT. Um, that'll be two pounds, and it'll be as fast as you can freaking pull the trigger. Um, you can almost walk the trigger on like the ULT ones, like I was saying. You can build an insanely great gun um, and still be kind of a classic gun connoisseur. Or you can, you know, stick with your $110 uh, classic mag uh, or, or something like this classic RT, which is kind of a unique piece in the uh, automatic history. So um, you can go out and buy all sorts of different stuff. So. Um, just keep that in mind if you're looking for an old school gun that you want to play with. Uh, the Automag, very realistic, high rate of fire. Uh, the only thing, the only real f problem with them, uh, they're not even heavy. The autocockers are heavy compared to modern guns, but if you get one of those ULE to everything guns, uh, they're actually right in that same uh, weight as modern guns. So the only problem is they are inefficient. Um, so you're going to want to underbore um, to get as much efficiency out of them as you can. So anyway, otherwise, auto mags are spectacular guns. Definitely a go-to gun. Solely furious. Go-to beer. Um, if you can get your hands on this stuff, it's delicious. Just absolutely delicious. Beer Advocate gives it a 96 out of 100, which is world class. Last I looked, I, I think it's actually like something like number 24 on Beer Advocate's worldwide list of beers. It's very good. So uh, you got you got good old Furious here, and you got good old Furious here. So you guys have a good one, and I'll talk to you later.